Hi everyone and welcome to Insights. My name is Kevin McGarvey. I'm a professor of English at Cumberland County College and my guest today is Blaise Menzoni. Blaise was born and bred in Vineland, was a product of the Vineland public school system. Uh, Blaise received a degree in accounting from the University of Delaware and he is currently the branch manager of Gateway Funding Mortgage Company in Vineland. Uh, Blaise is a local boy made real, real good. He knows a little bit about just about everything. And today what we're going to be doing is talking about real estate, mortgages, foreclosures, uh, bankruptcy, credit repair, and a lot of other things. We're going to try to squeeze a lot of information in a 30-minute show. So, uh, Blaze, first of all, thanks very much for being here, sir. Kevin, thank you very much for having me, uh, especially the great introduction. I, uh, you know, I got big shoes to fill now, so I appreciate that. And uh, I'll do my best to not let you down. Thank you. Uh, Blaze, let's talk about real estate, okay? Sure. Uh, nationally, uh, what's going on in the market, regionally what's happening, and then zoom right in and tell us in Cumberland County, what's what's happening? Well, it's no secret that nationally, we're, we've, I think we've finally seen things stabilize from the boom and the bubble that we saw back in the early 2000s through 2008. And we're finally starting to see some stabilization there. And I don't want to say that we're seeing an improvement yet, but I think we've stabilized. And a lot of the markets, California, Florida, Las Vegas that were hit really hard have come back. There's been some actual appreciation there and they've come back and I think we've seen things steady out and we're seeing more of a normalization through those markets um, globally. Um, you know, throughout the state of New Jersey, um, depending north to south is, as you know, almost two different states. Uh, so things are a little bit different. Um, so regionally, we're, we're starting to see things pick back up a little. And, um, you know, we've been, uh, we've been lucky, I think, here in Cumberland County, How where so? most people would think, looking at the demographic, that Cumberland County is, you know, one of the lower income and, and more, uh, I'm not sure what the right word I'm looking for here, uh, but the, I think we're the second poorest county in the state, if I'm correct. And, uh, you know, some more of the lower end thing, uh, you would think that they were hit hardest by some of the, the economic downturn. But luckily, as far as real estate values, we saw only a small dip where, you know, the other people saw that big, huge dip. Now, Blaise, wouldn't part of that be that we really didn't participate in in the big upswing, the boom itself? That's correct. You know, we also saw maybe ten to twelve percent appreciation a year at max. Where if you were in Miami, some of those people were seeing twenty-five, thirty percent appreciation in a year. So, you know, if you bought property in Miami in two thousand and sold it in two thousand eight, you're a very smart and wealthy person now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you held on till two thousand and ten, you weren't so smart and you're not so wealthy. Um, but like I said, in Cumberland County, we were pretty lucky to um, be insulated from all that. You know, we definitely didn't see the big upswings, but we also didn't see as much of a downswing. Um, you know, the real estate market is slowly picking up some steam. You know, we're luckily seeing our applications rise at Gateway, which is a good thing. Um, you know, we're slowly kind of etching back to where we should be, which is always a positive. And, um, you know, it, it's always just good to see it appreciate normally. I don't want to see it spike up like it did because then it's going to create another bubble. So places like, uh, as, as you said, California, Florida, yep. Las Vegas, Phoenix, these are places where uh, property values were increasing sometimes 15, 20, 25 percent a year. Oh yeah, maybe even 30. Yeah. And when the bust came, it really, it it really came and people were, were hurting. Mm -hmm. um, those were also places where people were buying properties and then, you know, flipping. fixing them up and what was the word? Flipping. Flipping, yep. And hopefully selling them a few months later for a, a, a big, big profit. That's not something that really was, uh, you know, prevalent around here, was it? No, not so much then. I mean, down the shore, we saw a lot of that. And there were some flips here it, it, locally in the county. Um, and now we're starting to see more property flippers get back involved. And now instead of just buying it off of anybody and letting the market appreciate it. Now what these property flippers are doing is they have to be a little more innovative. They have to be more hands-on. So now they're going to be the guy who comes in and buys that bank owned property that you can't get normal financing on, mm -hmm. gets a good deal because the bank just has to move it. They can't sell it to the average guy who needs to get an FHA or conventional mortgage. Mm -hmm. They need a cash buyer. So the flippers are starting to actually come back and now is actually even a better market for them because you know, they're really the only game out there that could acquire these properties. And at the same time, they're helping the buyers because if not, and the banks, because if not, that property is going to sit there. You need only a cash buyer. 
So no mortgage company or bank is going to finance it. You know, most of these houses have stolen pipes, holes in the wall, and they've been deteriorated by being empty. So these houses that have been foreclosed on that the flippers come in and they get, they're the only buyers, so the bank's happy to get rid of them. The buyer who wants to be the ultimate end user can't buy it in the condition that it's in. Mm -hmm. So there's a real marketplace for that right now because, you know, you have buyers that want these properties but can't afford to acquire them, fix them up, and then live in them. So the flippers are now coming in, mm -hmm. and they're buying off the banks. They're buying a lot of the short sales where the property's been damaged, and then ultimately reselling them to the end user. So we've actually seen probably in the last two years more of that than we have in my 12 years in the business. Really? Yeah. So the market itself, you say it's a good time right now. Is it a better time to sell or to buy right now? Uh, I think Is it's it definitely a better time to buy right now than to sell. Um, like I said, you know, I think that we've seen some stabilization in the market, but it's nowhere near where it was. And you know, if you don't have to sell to buy, that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, rates are still pretty low. I mean, you know, it's funny people come in and they complain about four and a quarter for thirty years at zero cost. Mm -hmm. And you know, yeah, two years ago it was three and a quarter uh, for those thirty years of, of, of money. And mm -hmm. you know, but if you look back into the early '80s and the Reaganomics, and uh, you know, you were happy to be paying seventeen, eighteen percent, and you were probably right. paying three or four points. Right. And you know, waiting in line. I can remember parents, my parents, telling me a story of them literally waiting in line at the savings and loan to get their mortgage, mm -hmm. and it was like a you know, like a concert. <laughs> I can can remember as well in the early 80s um, in graduate school, the uh, there was a, a bank called Atlantic Financial, mm -hmm. and I remember getting 21 and a half percent on a CD. On a, on a CD, yeah. I think a, a two-year CD. I think the one year paid only like 19 percent or something. But that's pretty amazing to think. Yeah. You know, to think about that. Yeah, it's it's quite a paradigm from where we are today. I mean. So, um, all right, so what about the prices around here? I mean, are the prices reasonable historically, or? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think so. I mean, you know, right now, in my opinion, houses are more affordable than rent. I mean, you, you know, said that to me before. You said that to me before before we began. How how, how can that be? Uh, because the money is still cheap, the values are still a little bit down, and rent is up. Landlords know. Landlords know that it's tough to get a mortgage right now. The credit market is is a little bit tough. We're starting to see things slowly open up again, but you got to be a pretty good borrower to get a mortgage in today's world. So a lot of people that would have been qualified in 04, 05, and 06 mm -hmm. now don't have the means to be qualified, so they have no choice but if they want a place for their family to rent a home. Mm -hmm. And landlords, you know, being investors, being savvy, have taken notice to that, and rents have gone up dramatically, where rates are still low, values are down. If you buy a $140,000 house with reasonable taxes, with an FHA loan of say only three and a half percent down, you could have a payment of eleven to twelve hundred dollars a month for a three bedroom, two bath house. Where if you go rent one of those in a decent neighborhood, you could be paying fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars a month. So, in my opinion, you know, I, I do think it's a it's a great time to buy. You can't predict the future, obviously, but you sure try to. Yeah. Well, where do you think prices are going to be in the next year or two or or five? Is my gut would be, and again, this is just a hunch, but my gut would be that I think we're going to see a two to three percent, you know, maybe four percent if we're lucky appreciation to, to stay over top of inflation and, and have normal house value appreciation. So I think if you buy today, you shouldn't get hurt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, are you going to get rich like if you bought in 2003 and sold mm -hmm. in 08? No, but that shouldn't happen anyway. But we, we really shouldn't look at home ownership as a as a, a primary means of investment anymore. I think back in the 70s and 80s and uh, even in the 90s, people would buy houses with the expectation that it, that it would increase in value 5-6% yeah. a year. Yeah. And you know, that simply doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Yeah. And then once you add all the, you know, the maintenance and all the you know, taxes and things, it, it really isn't, you can't look at it as a primary investment, but it is a place to live. Correct. It's something that you need and something that... Uh, That's correct. And we had previously talked about this, you know, and... Uh, you know, obviously, with my job selling mortgages, I think everyone should own a home, but you know, that's probably a little selfish on my part. Um, it, it's definitely the only reason to buy a home is not for an investment. I would agree with that 100%. Mm -hmm. But it is still the American dream to own your home. There's some a good feeling that you get when you pull into your driveway after a long day at work. You know, it makes that eight to 10, 12 hour shift that you just put in mm -hmm. worth it all. You know, you have that sense of pride. This is mine. I earned this. Um, and you, it's hard to put a price on that. Um, yeah, if you did a dollar cost comparison, it's probably not the greatest investment. But if you step back and look at it logically, well, okay, 
my mortgage might be $1,200 a year. Mm -hmm. I might have $2,000 a year in annual maintenance. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost me at least that to rent, to keep a roof over my family's head. So you're going to have that cost of living no matter what. Mm -hmm. Well, if you back that out, even if we don't see any appreciation, at the end of the day, owning your home was a good was a good investment because you've built that equity just by servicing the debt and paying it down. So if we got into a market, which shouldn't happen, where we saw no appreciation over a 30-year period, buying a home would still be a good investment because even if your monthly cost was slightly higher owning the house over renting, you got a tax break for writing off the mortgage interest, you got mm -hmm. a tax break for writing off the real estate taxes, and at the end of the day, you own something. I often hear that that tax break uh, mortgage deduction is in danger, that that's something that, uh, it is, and, that uh, Washington wants to get rid of. That's correct. Uh, you know, uh, anyone in the real estate field hopes that that does not happen because that's one of the main advantages mm -hmm. of, of owning a home is the tax benefit. And, um, you know, uh, I know NJAR, the New Jersey Association of Realtors, as well as locally, uh, or as well as no locally with the Cumberland County Board of Realtors, as well as nationally with the National Association of Realtors and RPAC, which is a, in a, an organization that supports realtors, have been fighting big time with Washington to keep that deduction because they understand the value that that has for homeowners and what it could do to A, the housing market, and B, we all know that the housing market is directly a cut tied to our economy today. Mm -hmm. So in order to prevent either of those things from dipping, I would hope that Washington has enough sense to keep those deductions in place, you know, at least for the foreseeable future. And the way that the mortgage deduction is designed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you get a mortgage, the first few years, your pay, most of what your payment correct. is, is interest. That's correct. And so I guess it's set up that the older you get, you know, supposedly, we hopefully we're making more money at 50 than we are at 40, and more at 40 and 30. Right. Not certainly not that that way for everyone these days, but uh, that's how it's designed so that by the time you get up into your middle age, that deduction becomes lower. lower. But it is a great incentive, is it not? Oh, it's it's a huge incentive. I mean, you know, it, on a 30-year mortgage, which is probably 75 to even probably 80 to 90 percent of the mortgages that we write are stretch over a 30-year amortization. Um, out of that first five years of payments, 90% of the principal and interest goes mm -hmm. to the interest. So there's a huge deduction initially, which is when you need it the most because you're going to be buying, especially for first-time home buyers, buying furniture, mm -hmm. buying TVs, you know, dishes, all, all the stuff that you need to get acclimated and live right. like a normal family. Right. Um, so getting that deduction initially, I, in my opinion, is more important than having it down the road. I guess it's a, a double-edged sword. I can remember when I bought my, my first house, and I had a $150,000 mortgage, and I remember paying that thing faithfully. And I think three or four years into it, I checked to see how much I still owed, and I owed about $147,500. Right. Yeah. Um, let's talk about mortgages. There, sure. there are a number of mortgages, and when, when people go to a mortgage broker, when they decide that they want to buy a house, mm -hmm. there are a number of mortgages to choose from. You said to me that there is a, a FHA loan, correct? a conventional mm -hmm. loan, mm -hmm. USDA, uh, VA, uh, Jumbo, Reverse, and ARMS. That's correct. Now, we, we only have a couple of minutes. We're only going to be able to, to, to tackle one or two of these in the first segment, and then we'll, we'll move on. Let's start with the FHA loan. Yep. What's, what's that all about? The FHA loan is a organization that's the Federal Housing uh, Administration, and it was created by HUD. Um, actually in 1934, uh, you know, when I researched it, I actually would have assumed that it was created later than that. Um, you know, I was surprised to see that it was created that early in our, our country's history. Um, but it was an organization created to help people achieve the dream of home ownership without having that 20% down. So the Federal Housing Administration is really just an insurance program to lenders. And what they do is they issue a set of underwriting criteria that allows you, the lender, to follow those underwriting guidelines and insure a loan. Mm -hmm. um, FHA is probably the most prevalent loan in our county because it requires only a 3.5% down payment. The most common FHA loan is a 30-year fixed product, so it insulates your buyer from any change in market, mm -hmm. and it's usually the most flexible with underwriting. So locally at our firm at Gateway, we probably originate, I would say, 70% of the loans that we originate over the last few years have been FHA mortgages. Now, are the criteria for FHA different than others? Yes. Can you have a, a uh, less than outstanding FICO credit score, for example, and qualify for an FHA and not for, for another? Conventional, that's correct. FHA has uh, lowered their credit score 
criteria lower than Fannie Mae, which is conventional, or Freddie Mac, which is also conventional, because they're geared to help people achieve that goal of home ownership. That was the organization's whole you know, reason for existence. Mm -hmm. um, and they do have the most flexible underwriting guidelines. Like I said, it allows a, like a, only a 3.5% down payment. And if you meet their guidelines, you're going to receive the same rate as the borrower who could put 20% down. Mm -hmm. Now, you are going to pay private mortgage insurance, or as FHA calls it, a mortgage insurance premium. Mm -hmm. Same thing, either, even no matter how you cut it, it's an insurance that you pay mm -hmm. that does the borrower absolutely no good. It insures the lender. So in the event of a default and the lender has to foreclose, mm -hmm. FHA has a pool of money there to cover the mortgage uh, or cover the lender of, up to any deficiency that they had through the foreclosure process, I as long you. as they've deemed that we've underwrote that loan to their guidelines that they've issued. Let's take a break and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the other kinds of mortgages. We'll talk about foreclosures, uh, what to do if you're facing foreclosures. We'll even go into bankruptcy and credit repair. So stick with us for the second half of the, of the show insights. Hi, I'm Larry Kane in the Cumberland Mall. All the best, everybody, at Cumberland County Community College. Your success begins there. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Kevin McGarvey. This is Insights. My guest is Blaise Manzoni. Um, Blaze, we were talking about mortgages before, and uh, we were talking about FHA mortgages mm -hmm. specifically, and you said you had a little bit more you wanted to say about those. Yeah, I mean, just basically getting across the point that it's probably the most prevalent mortgage um, in our area right now. It requires the least down payment aside from USDA and VA, and uh, like I said, the most flexible underwriting, which allows the lowest credit score, uh, the highest debt to income ratio. So, you know, it allows us to really get a lot of stuff done and help families that otherwise wouldn't be able to own homes. So, you know, I would say that it's probably one of our best aces in our hole. And then what's what's the second most popular type of mortgage? Uh, second most popular type of mortgage would be a conventional mortgage, which is backed by either Fannie Mae, which we've all heard about a lot in the news, or Freddie Mac, which are the two quasi-government entities that insure these conventional loans to, um, you know, to the to the government and in the secondary market, most importantly. Quasi-governmental, but yet for profit. I, I, yeah. I never was able to understand that, and I, that I, distinction. I, I would have to agree with you and say that I've been in the business for 12 years, and I really don't fully understand mm -hmm. how how they're a government yet for-profit entity either but you know they they help us uh, do what we do so I'm grateful for them but uh, yeah I, their structure and how they were set up is is often a puzzle to me as well um, but basically Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac your conventional loan um, loan options have moved to more of the elite borrower okay you go back about seven years ago and if you had a 620 credit score or an 800 credit score if you qualified for a conventional loan you got the same interest rate. Mm -hmm. uh, as the bubble bust and Fannie Mae took a lot of losses and lost a lot of money and got bailed out by the government like we all know, um, they said, well, we gotta clean our act up and how can we do this? So their executives got together and they came up with basically what they call risk-based pricing. Okay, so if you have a Fannie Mae loan now and you've been a good boy and paid all your bills on time and you have an 800 credit score, you're gonna get a better rate than the guy who might have missed a bill here or there and has a 680 credit score. Mm -hmm. We'd be able to do both loans, You would both, assuming you both qualify for the rest of the underwriting criteria. However, you as the you know, higher borrower with the better credit score is gonna be, you're gonna see a benefit by receiving a lower interest rate. So basically Fannie and Freddie have moved to your more elite borrowers. I see. Then there's the VA loan. That's right, the VA loan is for your veterans. It's backed by the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, and it's for either active duty or retired vets, and it allows no down payment and no mortgage insurance. Like we talked about USDA, um, FHA, and even conventional loans with less than 20% down all require a mortgage insurance. The only loan that you could get with no money down and no mortgage insurance is a VA loan. It's the one good thing that our country has done for the veterans who have went out and risked their life to give us the freedoms that we know as Americans. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's a great loan. And in the last few years, we've actually seen that become more prevalent because a lot of these guys are coming back from war and you know they're getting back into uh, you know becoming civilized, and not civilized, but getting back to normal civilization mm -hmm. and um, getting acclimated and uh, you know it's, uh, our, our, our VA applications are definitely up 
from where they were, I would say, six, seven years ago. What about adjustable rate mortgages, so-called arms? Now, we were talking a few minutes ago about uh, interest rates and yep. interest rates back in the 80s, you know, the, the, the prime rate, in fact, being, I think, 21, 22 percent. Right. When you buy an arm, as, as they're known, you know, your interest rate one year could be 3 percent, and the theoretically it could be 21 percent the next year. Um, to me, it sounds crazy. To me, it sounds like going to Vegas. The, it, it's definitely a gamble. Um, now, one thing, Kevin, is that it, it can't adjust that much. All these arms do have what they call caps. Ah. So they have a max adjustment, usually of 2% a year that you could increase. But you still can adjust. There's definitely flexibility. Most of those arms, they range from anywhere from a three-year arm up to a 10-year arm, mm -hmm. which means they're amortized over 30 years. Mm -hmm. But the first either three, five, seven, or 10 years the rate is fixed at a certain rate, which is a below market rate, I see. because then after that fixed rate period expires is when the mortgage starts to adjust. Now, again, if you got a, a, an arm five years ago and it adjusted today, mm -hmm. you're doing the dance of joy. You're gonna sure. be happy because those rates are lower. Sure. All those arms are basically tied to a certain financial index. Um, a lot of them are LIBOR arms, the London International Bank offered rate, mm -hmm. and there's a certain margin over that, and mm -hmm. that's how your rate varies. How popular are arms these days? Um, they're not that popular, especially in Cumberland County. An arm is for, you know, we do, we've done some maybe down the shore for that astute borrower who wants to manage his money properly and borrow the money at, say, if you're looking at a 30 year fix, you might be four and a quarter, where an arm might be 275. And if they have a goal to have that house paid off within that five year period while the rate's fixed, or seven year period while the rate's fixed, it is a great product. But your average home buyer is not looking at an arm because your average home buyer, especially in Cumberland County, is, you know, wants stability. They want to know what they could afford to keep a roof over their family's head. Mm -hmm. And an arm isn't the right product for them. Let's talk about foreclosures. Foreclosures yep. are uh, very serious, and yep. there are many people watching us right now that are, you know, if not, if not in foreclosure, are very close to it. Yep. Um, talk uh, about foreclosures nationally, and then once again, bring it in regionally. How do we compare with the rest of the country? Yeah, it, it's a surprising stat, and I think that if we, you know, come back a year later and do this show again, um, I'm going to have a totally different thing to say after next year. Um, uh, I just recently looked this morning, and in Cumberland County, there's 129 bank-owned properties. That doesn't include short sales. That's just actively listed for sale by a bank. Mm -hmm. That doesn't include foreclosures that have already foreclosed, just haven't hit the market yet. So That sounds was, to me like a relatively low number. I was, I was extremely shocked to see that it was as low as it was. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that a, a lot of that is due to the fact that in 2009, uh, Obama passed the bill and they put a, a five-year stay on halting a lot of these banks that had the, the robo-signing with all the documents and the notes mm -hmm. um, from foreclosing until they went through this extensive legal, you know, um, uh, extensive legal, it was a whole, I, I don't even know what the right word is, but they went, had to go through this whole rigmarole mm -hmm. to process process there you go thank you i was struggling there um to uh to actually complete the foreclosure well as we all know 2009 was five years ago that five-year stay is coming up mm -hmm. so i think that the last quarter the last half of this year and into 15 we're going to see a lot more foreclosures hit the market well, let's let's bring this right down to the street yep. uh, if if you are a month two months, three months behind in your mortgage. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people struggling. Our unemployment rate is right up around 13, 14% yep. right now. That's the official rate. The unofficial rate, the real number is likely higher than that. Yep. If you haven't uh, been able to pay your mortgage for a few months, what should you do? Uh, the first thing I would recommend doing is reaching out to your lender and trying to work something out. The worst thing you could do is run and hide from, from the problem. Uh, you gotta stare it in the face and try to come up with a solution. You know, if you financially have the means to get caught up, even make a, some type of partial payment arrangement, the banks don't want to foreclose on your property. So the banks, like utility companies, for example, will work with you in certain cases? Each bank is different. Um, you know, it, it, it still amazes me to, to this day that, you know, some banks are so willing to work with people where other people aren't. And, you know, you, you ask yourself, is it maybe just the person they dealt with there and how they were feeling that day? Or is it really an internal policy of that lender? 
Um, but we've seen so much where most of the banks in general are willing to help you. They don't want to foreclose on the properties. They're not in business to be property managers or landlords. Banks are in business to lend people money and make a profit off the interest. They don't want these ban- They don't want these properties. And you told me that once you receive something called a Liz Pendants, that's correct. That is a very serious notice. That's when it's your foreclosure has gone on, into the system, basically. That's correct. That is the bank's formal notice. It's filed with the county that you live in, mm-hmm. and it is the legal action that this is the beginning of foreclosure. Okay, so work with your financial institution, but once you receive that Liz pendants, that's time yeah. to, that the, it, you're in the system. You're in. And you need to... Yeah, you make need some, to make some calls. I mean, and depending the, depending on the bank, you know, the 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 outcome may vary there. And bankruptcy as an option is that it is well, uh, you know, there's been a lot that, of if you're out of options. Yeah, that's probably your last option. And there's been so much misconception uh, on a day to day basis. I talk to people who have filed bankruptcy, and they're told that that's their financial bailout and their financial freedom. And there's a certain truth to that. And there's a certain bigger part of that that's not really true. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you have had a financial difficulty and your only option is bankruptcy and you file for that bankruptcy, those creditors can no longer come after you. Mm -hmm. So you're free from any claim to them. Okay, now, however, in the case of a mortgage being included in that bankruptcy, so say you owe Bank of America $150,000, you can't get caught up and you have to file bankruptcy, you include that mortgage in the bankruptcy. Bank of America can't harass you for the money anymore. However, the foreclosure is still going to happen. Okay? The best thing to try to do is if you know you can't get caught up and you're filing bankruptcy, call your bank and try to do a deed in lieu of foreclosure, which is basically offering them the deed to the property, saying, I know I can't pay this. I've just filed bankruptcy. Do you want to wait through that process and get pennies on the dollar, if anything at all, or do you want to take this property now? In my opinion, that's the quickest way, especially if you're looking to regroup Mm -hmm. and get back on your feet. It's it's a scary situation to be in. Uh, In the very few minutes that we have credit repair, Mm -hmm. you told me that it's actually possible to repair your credit. Many people have, uh, you know, have had financial difficulties. They they look at their credit score. How how can you go go ahead and actually repair your credit Mm -hmm. on your own? We prefer to call it credit enhancement. The government has a couple uh they they don't like bankers saying credit repair um so we call it credit enhancement and basically it's utilization of credit uh revolving credit is the best way to enhance your credit so that's credit cards and the number one thing about credit which is never explained to people is common sense make your payments on time Mm -hmm. but the number two thing that affects your credit equally is making the payments on time is your utilization of your credit so what that means is what your balance is to what your limit is Mm -hmm. It's never told to most consumers, but in order to have a strong credit score, your balance should be under 50%, preferably under 30% of your limit. If you maintain balances 50 or 30% of your limit or below, Mm -hmm. you're going to be in that higher echelon of credit. So when we see some people, you see a lot of good people who come in and pay their bills faithfully, Mm -hmm. but might be maxed out and they have poor credit scores. So they're the easy easy ones to get their their credit enhanced. It's it's so mysterious. It's it's so mysterious. And and to me, I think it's kind of a flaw, and we've talked about this personally, in the education system, is that it's not mandated to have at least a senior in high school, uh, uh, an hour class of credit management, balancing your checkbook, Mm -hmm. and and let... This might help some of the bigger global economic problems. Let's, let's talk about education some other day. We, could, <laughs> we can go there. We have like 45 seconds, please. Okay. Um, you are the chief financial officer of a, a company in Vineland called BC Technologies? That's correct. And um, we basically do um, merchant services is the, is the core of that business. And uh, we try to take the mom and pop shops of the world and allow them to compete with the Walmarts and conglomerates of the world by offering technology offerings and payment processing in the 21st century. And this is a real local uh, activity, and we're, oh, yeah. we're, real, we're real proud of you. Thank Plays, you. we're out of time. Oh, Kevin, thank you very much for it's having me. It's been great having you, sir. It's a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. My name is Kevin McGarvey. My guest has been Blaze Benzoni. We'll see you next time on Insights.